It's uh, 12 o'clock, Leo, so All why don't right. you so, take it away? Hi, everybody. I didn't change the title from last week, uh, but it's obviously not on the federal crisis today, though we do have a federal crisis, and clearly in more ways than one, because states across the country and the states are increasing in the virus as we speak. And some of those states are red states, which gives us hope that next week, negotiations on the stimulus package will go better than they would have gone uh, weeks ago. Uh, but we can't be sure. Um, so the number of persons stayed. Leo, you're echoing. Yeah, got it? Great. Um, it, it stayed in the 60s, so there's almost a million people. We're, we're 70,000 shy, and a week and a half we'll be at a million people tested. And um, but first time since the pandemic, the total number of cases declined. That did make sense to me. Uh, I didn't double check that number, 4,338 fewer cases. And then some correction was made in, in deaths. But when I looked at another number, the number was uh, down further in the charts, uh, was 80. 200 or 8400 so again fewer deaths i don't know if you saw the news today yesterday um th there was the fewest deaths so far in massachusetts or or matching you know the days that have had the fewest day deaths so we're doing very well as a state um obviously with opening up businesses more this week and next week um you know that might change things but right now we're doing better than we thought. And then, of course, the state leaders, Governor and Mary Lou Sutters and others, uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito, they're now targeting certain communities where the statistics don't look as good as other communities. And it's Chelsea, Everett, Fall River, Lawrence, L Lowell, Lynn, Marlboro, and New Bedford. Um, the other thing I'm going to share with you is I was sort of shocked when it went down on the chart that deaths in long-term care settings were actually 5,258. Um, which when you look at the total number of deaths, that's, I, I guess I never saw it quite that way before. Um, I am going to follow up on that number, but it, it blew me away. You know, honestly, it's on a chart. In fact, I think I can share that with you. If I'm able to, for a second, let me see about sharing that chart with you. Um, because it's, it's, uh, is this it? Yeah, let me, let me show you the chart. I'm going to, can you see this chart now or you still see the PowerPoint? Let's hit resume share. I'm gonna hit new share and I'm gonna show you this, okay? And what I'm gonna do is- Yeah, we're, we're still, uh, okay, we're, we're all set now. You see it now, right? So I wanna get the yep, page. We're good. I had the page written down. Uh, this is of course the deaths by age group and that's where you see Brian Cusack on my board had mentioned this earlier this year, how um, the average age of deaths is 82 years of age, right? But here's, here's the thing, when you get to long-term care facilities, okay? Now this includes staff probably, 5,258. This is the chart I wanted you to see. So when you see the average age is 82, and then you have race and ethnicity, I mean, we're not gonna, this could take, you know, all day to go through those numbers, but I just wanted to share that with you. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so it's, it's this, this is why it's so important for us to follow directions because the virus affects different people, different ages, differently. Um, and then you, when you get the PDF, you'll also get the current dashboard where you can look at the, um, you know, the, the, in our congregate care system and you can see archived the past one. So we had, the last time they showed you the total deaths, it was 85. And ever since then, the weekly report says less than five. I don't know, you know, obviously I don't know if it's two or it's one or it's four, it's less than five. So I would say we're, you know, approaching the 90 to 100 range of deaths in our state operated and provider operated congregate care system. Um, and again, Thank goodness it's, it's slowed down remarkably and hopefully it'll, it'll come down to zero. Um, so, and, and as I mentioned earlier, state and federal update, 15th is tax day. So they will, we will know federal and state tax collections. And then next week, we're really hoping 
to get some serious negotiations. And the fact that the red states are having a terrible time with the virus. Florida had the biggest all-time growth this past week of cases. Um, so we have to worry about people living in Florida and other states. Arizona, I'm pretty sure has had a tough row. So that's, that's the sort of recap of where COVID is. And then um, what we really want to do today, and I'm really excited about it, as I said, we were originally going to have Whitney Moyer here, who oversees the Office of Long-Term Supports and Services at Mass Health. She'll be with us next week. Um, things happened, and she wasn't able, uh, late Friday, she let me know that she could not be here today. Um, so I picked up the phone and actually waited till the weekend was over. I had a couple of different options and I said, you know what, I'm gonna shoot an email to my colleague, uh, Jay Lynch, and we're gonna talk about families and supports. We're gonna talk about the reopening of day services. And um, so let me introduce you to our two guests. Um, uh, and this is a picture uh, from a few years ago, Jay and Jessica. <laughs> Jessica's not in the picture, unfortunately, but I'm pretty sure. But, uh, you know, but Jay um, is accepting award for the team for um, the work they did in family support and are doing in family support and um, the accomplishments. And as you can see, it's a diverse team because the Brockton area is a diverse region. So um, Jay Lynch has been the executive director Oh my God, I know it's a least. So Jay, you and I met at city council chambers in Quincy, right? City Hall. You came with uh, the former um, Sawyer, Betty Sawyer. Hey, I, I pulled that up. Right. Very good. Probably in 82, <laughs> right? So you were probably executive director by 85, 86. What do you think? Am I off? A, a little bit, yes. I, I became the executive director in 92. Okay, wow. I, you, worked, I was here eight years as a program director. So, and, and, and Jay in the past, you know, was in Vista as a young man, as was his wife. Yes. And, um, and Jessica Gonzalez, who's been working with you for about a year and a half now, Jessica, who yep. came from the Arc of Greater Plymouth. Yep. I came from, yep, I, I was at the Arc of Greater Plymouth for almost four years and then and came here about a year and a half ago. Yeah, and, 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 uh, I know you work with Carrie and others across state, not just doing what you do there, but also being part of improving practices for in family support across the state. So I really appreciate your, your work on that as well. Thank you, Jessica. And so I'm really pleased. Um, I get to sit in once in a while at these meetings that Carrie coordinates. Carrie's, um, and, and basically the whole idea is to do what we need to do for families across Commonwealth and, um, so Brock is one of those places where I think good things happen. And so I'm really pleased that you were able to join us today as well. Um, so I just, I, you know, Jay, if you want to just introduce the family sport and then Jessica, I think is going to touch on um, some of the success stories, but also some of what we're struggling with right now, right? Because I think to me, from our advocacy goals, we've tried hard to introduce more family um, support into the picture. But the biggest uh, source of family support, besides increased PCA hours through Mass Health, if you're eligible, right, for the PCA program, and if you can find someone <laughs> to, to come into your home <laughs> during COVID and before or after COVID, right, it, it doesn't even matter because of the rate of pay is really what you guys have been doing with other family support centers in terms of helping families on the ground. So, uh, can can either of you, Jay, or you, just share a little bit about? your family support region and, and uh, the, the range of people you serve and then some, something about the status of how things are going. Okay. okay you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for this opportunity to be on uh, with you, Leo. And um, uh, the Brockton area arc uh, has been providing family support centers, um, uh, services since um, 2000 and uh, oh, it, 10 years ago we became uh, uh, the funded family support center uh, when we were awarded the DDS contract and we serve the city of Brockton and the 10 surrounding towns but we're not just restricted to uh, that geographic area because 
Sometimes we're uh, coordinating with other chapters of the ARC or other organizations because we want to try to reach out to uh, more people when there's an opportunity for uh, a speaker or a training or something along that line. Uh, one thing that uh, Jessica uh, has done a great job of is uh, continuing the excellent communication with uh, the, the Brockton area DDS area office and in particular uh, with the area director Beth Moran Liuzzo. Um, and so maybe Jessica, you can tell us how this uh, communication has uh, been helping other people. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am in contact like Jay had said, um, pretty much on a daily basis um, with the Brockton area director. Um, and as far as the, since the COVID pandemic, um, you know, everybody's home. We've got kids that are home. We've got, you know, folks that were going to CBDS programs, day hubs, and they're all home. And a lot of them did not have access to technology to get access to um, the Zoom meetings, the programming that, that we have, um, even, even programming that other agencies are offering for, for people to, to stay connected, to, to see each other. Um, so we got a little creative with the funding, the FLEPS funding, um, because you know we did have a, a pretty decent budget to do some social recreation activities, some large activities. Obviously, we can't do those types of things now. Um, so we were able to reallocate that funding. And so far, we've procured probably about 60 iPads for people, um, for children, adults. Um, some of the service coordinators have come in to, to pick them up and we get them out to people. Um, so that's been a huge help. Um, the other the other way we were able to help um, was to get gift cards um, for food, um, basic needs, groceries. Um, we have a lot of families that, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, they were, you know, parents were laid off, they weren't working, it was taking a long time to get unemployment, they, they, they didn't have food in their house. Um, so we were able to help with that. Um, and again, with, with the FLEX funding, it, guidelines got loosened up a little bit too for us um for the state and um you know we were able to you know pay electric bills things like that um and it, it's that, been that's good. let me jump in on one question yeah. so you actually yeah. service creators actually personally came and helped deliver yeah. something so yeah. that's great for people to know because i think you know th there hasn't been a whole lot of discussion about that so it's great that you share that and then secondly you're paying electric bills and, and things like that, that you, you were able to get flexibility on. And that's just people weren't able to work and. Yeah, yeah. And, if, and if we have some folks that were able to return to work, but it's not full time, they're not, you know, they, their finances have changed drastically. And these are some people that were already fa facing financial issues. So on top of what they were already dealing with, now they're, child, teenager, uh, you know, other family member is home and it, it's, you know, it's more food, it's more groceries, it's the electric bill is higher now because we've got the AC running and, you know, it, it's a lot of things combined. So, um, and people aren't back to work full time yet. So a lot of my folks aren't. So we're still facing those challenges. But again, working with DDS, um, it, they've been, they've been wonderful with us. So. Um, and not only has service co some service coordinators come by to pick up the iPads or the gift cards or whatever it, it is, um, I was able to get out to, you know, uh, to deliver um, an iPad to somebody. One of my, um, my family support navigators um, went grocery shopping for somebody, um, the, the family. The mom was actually in the hospital with COVID. The dad was COVID positive. So they had nobody to, to even get food in. So Kathy Hickey um, went out to the, the grocery store for them and, you know, dropped everything off on their porch. And so it's, it's really been a, a team effort to help as many people as we can in any way we can. So what do you worry about based on what your team and uh, you noticed? What do you worry about for as this continues, right? And um, uh, I'm my, yeah. my, my worry right now is 
because we're only starting at the 50% with the flex funding, I mean, that's not a lot of money. The average allocation for a family, which most people know, is it, the average is about $750 for the year. That's not a lot of money to begin with. Well, now we're starting at half of that um, because we don't have, they don't have a budget. Um, so, so that concerns me. Um, and people are still home. Kids are still home. There, there are folks that, you know, need childcare. There are some essential workers. <coughs> you know, I have families that the, the mother or father or are essential workers and they have to go back to work. Meanwhile, they need to pay somebody to care for their loved one at home and they're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, you know, I, I can utilize some other options that we have here if their family support stipend runs out, like, you know, we partner with United Way and there's some emergency fund, but that's, that's not a lot of money um, to, to pay folks. What about, so I didn't appreciate that. Um, see, this is what we, you know, in the June when they talked about releasing the contracts at 100% of funding for six months, mm -hmm. I worried that agencies would feel pressure to be really careful how they spent that money. Did you get a directive from DDS to spend it that way? Or was it just more of a common sense kind of safety? What, the 50%? Yeah, the strategy. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's what I got from, from DDS to, to okay. start at 50%. So. so, you know, it was presented to me early on as people are getting 100% of their funding for six months. And so naively, I assume that meant, you know, you'd be able to give the part of the full, and, and technically you're right, that would be you only have six months of the stipend. Right, right. right. So right. that actually logically makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but some people may need it at different times of the year, right, the stipend. Right. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, have people been at the end of their, which you mentioned how people need childcare or even young adult care, you know? Yep. And how many, could you even guess at the percentage of people really sort of at the edge in terms of their ability to sustain the 24 seven kind of support they're giving or even people living independently who are having trouble finding caregivers? Mm -hmm. uh, percentage wise, I mean, it, it's more than half. I, I would say it's more than half of our folks. I mean, um, especially, folks with what i'm hearing a lot of is it's folks with um children um with with with, with young ones um and it, it's not just going back to work it, and and having somebody watch their child it's also having access and knowing how to access these zoom calls and and the you know things that school departments are doing over the summer you need somebody to be able to help the child access this and, and get work done too so it's it's a that's also a challenge. And what do you think is there, and, and uh, the whole issue of the diverse communities, people, parents and family members who, who English may not be a strong language for them, they may speak it, some may not speak it, but you know, how has that been adjusting to this using virtual for them? That's, How's that gone? That's been a challenge as well, but I'm lucky to have, um, you know, my, my Cape Verdean, um, outreach, my uh, coordinator and my Haitian outreach coordinator, um, they have set up different, different things where the parents can come together and talk. Um, I, I feel like they're working more than they normally do. It's two part-time positions, but they're, they're working constantly. They're answering phone calls at home and on the phone with social security with these families because again english is not their first language and they need help navigating these things and my staff have been pretty great about doing whatever they can to to help out you know um, looking for pca services help with social security help with unemployment um iep meetings all these things um so they do it through whatsapp um they have a, they have a, my haitian outreach coordinator um set up a, a group on WhatsApp. My Cape Verdean outreach coordinator does Zoom meetings with her and FaceTime. They do a lot of FaceTime, a lot of one-on-one -on -one FaceTime things um, too, so. And so you have some virtual parent groups that have been- I do, I do. Um, it, not just for that, but but also um, we have a connecting caregivers group um, as well. Um, my 
DESE navigator set that up for parents and they, they call it their therapy. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But well, I mean, it, it's nice to hear from other folks that are going through the same thing and have the same concerns and the same worries, like, you know, what are we going to do here? So. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, my good friend, um, that's a mutual colleague of both of yours, Ronald Raphael has always said from the Haitian uh, American Public Health Institute, uh, he's always appreciated working with you guys. Um, so I just want to throw that in there because Thank about you. a year and a half, two years ago, he was telling me that. And um, Thank you. Yeah, just want to share. So, you know, Jay and I have a have a, our therapy group too, you know. We meet uh, every week with fellow colleagues to, <laughs> to talk right. about what's going on. And, and yeah. these days, uh, it's been a lot about, last few weeks, um, about reopening day services. And uh, I'm going to come back to families and supports at the end of this dialogue because I do think we have a lot of unfinished business in that area for advocacy. So, Jay, I, I mean, I, I know that um, it's pretty tough trying to figure this out. Um, do you want to, sh I'm you do have some services going on, like employment services, and do you want to share what you do have that's happening and what you're grappling with? Okay. Well, when we had our primary uh, services, our uh, uh, day services, a day habilitation program and an employment and CBDS program. Um, and they have been closed since March 16th. Um, something um, that uh, we learned to do quickly was to take advantage of some trainings that uh, colleagues were doing and uh, and then our staff that got trained were able to train other people and we were able to uh, initiate teleprogramming, if you will, uh, remote services. Um, so uh, that was great. In addition to wellness checks on a weekly basis, we could, uh, uh, and we've continued to develop this over time. As we outreach and we speak to more and more people over the course of the week, the question always comes up, when are we gonna reopen? When am I gonna be able to come back to work? When am I gonna get my next paycheck? And things like that. Um, so there's so many more questions than there are answers. Uh, and, and, and that's been a struggle for me personally, uh, still is. But as all of these questions started to come up, and even thinking about reopening in some capacity. Um, I had a, a brainstorm and I said, I can't do this myself. So I recruited a team um, of individuals and staff members and board members and parents. And we've been meeting on a weekly basis, even if it's just to ask each other the questions that we're gonna need answers to. And through that, um, team, we started to come up with some answers about what we might be able to do and taking some small steps towards reopening. Uh, recycling is considered an essential business and we were hearing from the Department of Environmental Protection about um, <laughs> maybe you can uh, reopen your redemption center because they're getting lots of calls about it being closed. So we started looking at that first, and, and then we started make, listing all of the people that were saying they wanted to come back to work. Then the next step was to communicate with their families and their guardians, and, and then try to put all the other little pieces together. How are we gonna do this safely? And that's where the staff, uh, came into play. We developed these plans and we tried them out, staff only, step by step. How are we going to do this? How are we going to uh, manage that? What's the uh, procedure going to be? Uh, what do we need to be aware of? And so we put together um, all of these safety measures for reopening the Redemption Center. And then we brought it to the team and the team um, reviewed all of that and gave us some guidance, put out some, uh, pointed out some gaps in our planning that we fixed. And then uh, we started doing real baby steps. Uh, we opened one day for redemption um, just to see how that would go. 
And now we've uh, got a very part-time schedule. Uh, we've been adding individuals to the schedule to work. Uh, all the customers stay outside of the building uh, so that we're not actively interacting uh, with them inside like we used to. Um, the families have come and observed um, to see that their uh, son or daughter is learning um, about wearing masks and the importance of that and social distancing. So it's been all of these steps coming together, lots of tr staff training, lots of training for the individuals. When anybody comes for the first time uh, to return to work, uh, they, they receive training and all of the safety procedures that we have in place. Um, and, um, and then we've been able to put all the other little pieces together for transportation. In some cases, we're providing the transportation. In most cases, the family's providing transportation. In some instances, we've been able to use Dialabat, uh, the paratransit provider here in Brockton, and, and make arrangements for there. But um, all of our hand washing and cleaning and sanitizing and social distancing and mask wearing and <laughs> personal protection equipment, all of those things have to be considered just to do that. And now, since uh, the EOHHS guidelines were released on July 2nd, we're trying to uh, create plans that will allow us to reopen our day programs for those individuals that want to return and feel that it would be safe enough if we have the, all of uh, the steps and measures in place for them to return. So that's where we are these days, Leo, the, the 20 oh, page yeah. of pages of yeah. guidance from the <laughs> OHHS is, is daunting. Um, um, I heard somebody um, describe it as an exhausting read, and uh, <laughs> that's the perfect description of that. So we're trying to break that down. Uh, piece Jay, by piece Jay and, you're exaggerating a little. I know it's a 28 page pack, but I think it's mainly 26 pages that you have. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a funny joke, is it, to you? Oh, right. So, so seriously, though, back to being serious, because it is, it, people should understand, that was July 2nd, and then technically you could have opened on July 6th, so it wasn't going to happen on July 6th. How All many right. weeks has the Redemption Center been open? When you oh, even that first trial day, you know, starting? Right, that was um, towards the end of, of May. Oh, and wow. We've been, we've been building... Oh. Um, since then. Wow. Okay. So you have a lot of experience. And you're right. So now day. we're open Mondays <laughs> and Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. We're open a half day <laughs> on Fridays and we're open Saturday mornings also. So, and then do you think that gives you confidence about the day services? Yes. We have learned some things from the, the steps that we put in place for the redemption. And um, what people have been doing is since the guidance came, we've been comparing the guidance with the measures that we have had in place for reopening redemption uh, center operations and seeing what else we need to do. And so it's an ongoing process. Um, there's a, 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 a staff training for all of us at 2.30 this afternoon to uh, make sure that we are aware of the new steps that are being put in place because of the, uh, the new guidelines that we received, things like screening and temperature taking and so forth and so on. Um, and uh, so those are good lessons learned and yes, we'll be able to take that. I, I am hopeful and use what we've learned so far and add those elements into our reopening safely considerations for our day habilitation program and our CBDS and employment services. And are people working at other places right now in supported employment? Yes, we have some that have worked throughout because they've been considered uh, essential. Uh, um, we have somebody that's worked at the Home Depot, somebody that's worked in uh, 
at Stonehill College uh, throughout. And we have uh, a person that's been called back to his job at Walgreens. Um, and that's, he's, he's gone back for training last week and he's going back to work uh, this week. You know, one thing we're interested in learning more about is as people go back to work and try to get jobs, we want to know if the discrimination has increased in terms well, of hiring. Because we have one story already of someone who, you know, when he said what his disability was, they didn't know at first. Um, the interview pretty much stopped. And um, he's, so we're trying to sort of gather to see if this is pervasive, right? Is it happening a lot of places? Is it, um, so it'll be interesting to see your experience as people start helping people get back to work at new jobs, what, what your experiences become. Um, anything you want to add about the day program? Because I have one more question I'm going to ask both of you about families. And um, I, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, this happens to be a hot topic of, across the nation among self-advocates. And what we're finding is that we're not included. <coughs> um, a lot of decisions of are being made. In terms of including in? Include, in terms of reopening, reopening the community, reopening day services. Of course, people want to go get out of their homes, but people aren't being told the risks. A lot of people are afraid to go out because of the risks. Um, a lot of people don't know the risks. So are you, in, are you telling the people, the individuals coming into your day programs, the risks of traveling in a van, um, the risks of being near each other, even if it is social distancing, and it's their human right to know the risks of going back into the community, and do they want to take that risk? And, and, you're and, right. do have, and, and do they have fears? Because in talking in other groups to people, they have a lot of fears of coming coming outside again after being um, inside for such a long time. Yeah. Well, Some so, of them are just being told to yeah. go back to day services rather than being at home, even if it is for a reduced time or just a couple days of week a week instead of every day. So let, Ann, let's let Jay answer two of those questions. I don't think you can answer sure. one. How about number one being, um, you know, how do you, how are you planning to warn people? But also, didn't you say you had people involved in the team for planning the Redemption Center? Did I miss, did I? Miss yes, one? we've included people that, uh, uh, that participate in our programs on our team. And one of the people is also on our safety committee. So that, um, that was a good thing for her to, step up and offer to be part of the team. But yes, we have not uh, asked anybody to come back that, um, that has objected or voiced any, any fears about returning. Uh, we've taken the time to uh, explain things with each person that's expressed interest on returning so far. Um, educating them as to uh, what the risks are, um, what the safety measures are, um, and what the, uh, uh, and begin the training even before they get here. Uh, sometimes we've done remote trainings um, so that everybody has an awareness of how um, difficult this COVID-19 situation is and how contagious it can be. Um, we, there's new measures in the guidelines and too that are making us take additional steps. We've surveyed all of the people that we serve that we could get in touch with. And we've been told some people are interested in returning, others not at this time. Others need a lot more time before they'll even consider it. Uh, People want to see what safety measures we put in place. So we're developing a training video so that we can demonstrate that to people. Uh, we want them to make uh, 
uh, the, the best uh, decisions they they can for themselves, um, and without you know feeling any pressure that um, we need them to come back or we're we're pressuring them to return. So the the uh, risk benefit tool also DDS added yes. right back. Yes, thank you, and that'll be our yeah. next step. After having surveyed everybody, we're going to institute uh, that uh, risk benefit tool beginning in this this week. So I want to ask uh, Jessica if you were wave a magic wand and say to me, what else could we do for family advocate for in terms of the situation that either individuals living on their own field or families that, given your experience with the outreach, what would it be? Right now, um, what you had mentioned before, uh, getting help with getting PCAs in the house, um, that's huge um, on, on all levels for children, teens, young adults, our older folks. Um, that's one of the greatest ones, the child care. Um, and and more more funding. I mean, I, I wish the state, I mean, I know I know it's, they don't have it, but I, I wish they would kind of figure out what is going on so that we know what to tell these folks. I mean, I'd rather tell them we're working at 50% and then hopefully be able to get them more funding for the next six months. Um, you'd always rather do that than say, hey, you've got 750. Oh, sorry, now we have to take that away. You know, you, you never want to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I really I really hope they figure out what they're going to be doing for the year. And I'm sure everybody feels the same way um, because we have a lot of families that are nervous about that. They, they depend on this money, so. And, um, okay, excellent. And then I just want to open up and ask the question, but I wonder if there's other people in the chat, Carrie, or if people have any other questions they'd like to ask. Uh, I don't want to eat up all, I have more I could ask, but it's, I'm nervous because we've got about seven minutes or so left. I don't want to hog all the time. Nothing, <clears throat> uh, nothing in the chat, Leo. Okay. So one of the other things I want to ask about in terms of the service system, um, when, when people were surveyed, um, did you, what percentage of people said they wanted to come back, Jay? Do you have a sense of that? Yes, it was. It was more than 60%. Wow, okay. And wow. then there's, there's people that are very interested in uh, continuing with the remote services, the teleprogramming, and coming back on a part-time basis. So I've heard this referred to as hybrid kinds of services now you know, a combination of in-person and remote. Okay. And so we're going to um, try to be put that together and, um, and continue that uh, to develop that as we go forward. And we're hopeful that that's going to be something that's uh, allowable in our, you know, funding contracts. And, and to what extent the fact that you have a family support center, uh, and both of you can answer this, to what extent was that like critical in terms of serving, if you didn't have the family support center, in terms of understanding what was going on, um, how did that make a difference in your ability to respond as an organization? Early on, we all, uh, you know, as we're making things up as we go, we have to cancel for March 16th, but they, called the program directors together and by the end of the week I had this new idea. I want the program directors and the case managers to do wellness calls to everybody that we serve in the day programs. And I put together a list of uh, questions and we thought of other things, you know, let's find out what technology they have or don't have, but what, what, what needs might the family or the person be experiencing when you speak to them, please ask. And every time we would get a response, I would give it to Jessica and Jessica and the Family Support Center staff would figure out how to respond. And some of it was, um, uh, you know, things like iPads, but it, 
there were other situations where there were more immediate needs like food and um, rent and you know uh, uh, so but so every circumstance that we were able to identify the family support center was able to find a way to to respond to it that's great so you had a ready um, that's great it, you had a ready way to have a response that you would know the outcome um, the, the there's a couple of um, oh excuse me hi Leo uh, there's a couple of uh, questions in the chat um, Alice, this is from Alice is there any thought to delivery of day services in group homes long term this crisis kind of highlights how much time our loved ones spend in transport and transitions which are difficult for them yes I agree I'm I'm in the process, Kerry, of reaching out to the residential uh, service providers um, that uh, have people that have come to our day programs because I, I want to establish lines of communication and see how we might be able to do things together uh, um, to try to include some of the people if they're ready uh, to return to day programs or um, assist with teleprogramming and remote services or any combination of things like that so okay great thanks jay You're and welcome. then diane had a question do you, have, do you serve any families who have taken their loved ones home from group homes so we we do have um, a few that i'm aware of um, and the ones that have gone home are still home. Um, they're, they haven't returned to the, the group home, um, but the family's choice. So um, they're just taking, you know, what, what makes them feel safe. Um, they're not comfortable sending their, their loved one back yet. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then Christine, uh, asked, does anybody know if the day program is limited in attendance by the indoor limits for gatherings set by Governor Baker? Is it limited to 25? No, but Jay will answer that's a huge limitation. Jay, if you want to share what it's based yes. on. The, the new guidelines, initially we were making plans to uh, allow for six feet of social distancing. And so we were doing all kinds of measurements and uh, rearranging and uh, putting chairs away and so forth and so on. But the new guidance that EOHHS has just come out with um, is recommending that that be um, a, a space of 113 square feet per person. So that is going to have a limit on how many people can be in the building. So it's almost like a six foot circumference of um, of um, social distancing space yeah so so, so it's like maybe 113 square feet so it might be a 50 percent impact is that fear uh, i think it's going to we'll probably be less than 50 yeah probably 35 percent your capacity is going to be 35 percent of what it was yes okay wow yeah, and, and someone just mentioned that sounds like nine square feet. Um, it's it's 100, so 36 square feet is six times six, right? That's what I was taught in school. Yes. But uh, um, but clearly 113 square feet is, uh, you know, right. maybe it's bigger, more than nine feet. I don't know, Elizabeth mentioned Well, it's that. a circle with a radius of six feet. Yes. And so, our, our colleague Al was quick enough to calculate that in his head. So that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been great. I, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm, I sometimes let it go beyond schedule. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to uh, call it a session. I really, you know, short notice you got on, which is awesome. And, uh, and basically, I was, very, you know, really pleased about what you were able to share. Um, thank you for doing it. I knew I could count on you guys to, you know, knock it out of the park. So this is a tough time. It's really, it's challenging for all of us. It's hard to believe it's July. I said in the beginning, and uh, 
it, it doesn't feel like a normal July, right? So hang in there. Thank you for all you're doing, Jessica. Thank you, Jay, for all you're doing. And everyone on the call, hang in there. Thanks for the ways you're contributing as well. And um, Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesday, Kerry, what's going on? Well, she doesn't hear me maybe, but I can tell you later this month, whatever the Tuesdays and Thursdays are at 2 p.m., um, we're gonna have, I think it's next week, Rachel Rovat do a trauma-informed care presentations, and we'll be promoting that this week. And this one's gonna be recorded, so we'll be able to share it with people even after, because we have been through a traumatic time, and, um, and hopefully that'll be another contribution besides the webinars happening this week. Everybody have a great, great rest of the day. Thanks again, Jay. Thanks again, Jessica. And all my- You're welcome, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Good job.